And uh, gradually they were able to build a strong movement and probably from that, beginning in the 30s and their efforts in the 40s, they made a village in southern New Jersey, Isildeen Village, another village in upstate New York where brothers and sisters would migrate and establish little Muslim villages out in the wilderness, grow their own food, have their masjids, schools, and uh, the kids, the children would usually drift back to the cities, but a lot of them are still, especially upstate New York, uh, on these lands. But that movement uh, merged with the movement of a, a, a couple, usually uh, mentioned as being from Trinidad, uh, uh, Sheikh Daoud Faisal and his wife Khadija. So they, she's popularly known as Mother Khadija. And they started Da'wah in New York City and Brooklyn. And they were able to build a very strong community throughout the 50s and 60s, and uh, primarily on the East Coast. So there's a, there's a whole history of that. But going back to this era, that early era, before Ibrahim Abdurrahman came to the United States and eventually ending up in Natchez, Mississippi, uh, and his life chronicled, uh, there was another amazing story in colonial America, the story, and it really comes back here to England, and that's the story of, uh, of uh, Ayub bin Suleiman, who's known in America as the fortunate slave because his life illustrates so much blessing that even the non-Muslims said he was fortunate. So Ayyub bin Suleiman also was from the Fulani people like Ibrahim Abdurrahman. He was an imam amongst his people. His father was the leader of their people from a region known as Bandu or Bundu in eastern Senegal, the northern regions of Futa Jalon, and a very strong Muslim people. He memorized Quran. He was trained in the uh, traditional Maliki uh, West African curriculum, which was predicated on the uh, classical Greek system of the trivium and the quadrivium, trivium being grammar, rhetoric, logic. So in, in Arabic studies, it's called Nahu, Balagha, and Mantaq. And, and then the quadrivium, music, geometry. Uh, music being studying the relationship between sound and time. So music, not necessarily music as we know it, but the foundation of music, the relationship between sound and time, uh, geometry, astronomy, and uh, arithmetic, mathematics. So he was trained in that, so he knew how to think very well. And he memorized Quran. He was a very knowledgeable young man, taken into slavery, uh, sold. His father heard he was captured. He sent gold to the ship uh, but the ship itself for the Americas landing in Annapolis, Maryland in 1731 in colonial America. He spent 18 years, months in bondage. Uh, he ran away because he couldn't pray. He would pray and then the master's children would find him and throw dirt on his head and insult him. So he ran away. They captured him. Uh, they identified where he was, was from, a man who knew Another slave knew Arabic, they were able to communicate. They brought him back. Usually when slaves ran away, they were punished severely, but in this case, he was asked why he ran away. He said he couldn't pray. So he was given a musalla. And then he said he didn't like working in the fields. His people were pastoral people. So he was put in charge of the horses and the livestock. And so was, uh, that really uh, atypical treatment, but I believe he was a saint. He was a wali of Allah. And uh, eventually he wrote a letter in Arabic, dispatched it uh, to, he heard that the ship that had brought him to America had come back to uh, Annapolis. Uh, he wrote a letter. When the letter reached Annapolis, he was in Kent County, Maryland, in the Chesapeake Bay Area. The letter reached Annapolis. The ship had sailed on to England. The letter was dispatched to England. When the letter got to England, the ship had sailed on to Africa. The letter ended up in the hand of James Bartholomew, or Oglethorpe, rather. Oglethorpe was one of the founders of the originally slave-free colony of Georgia. Uh, Oglethorpe couldn't read Arabic. He sent it to the Oriental Orientalists at Oxford University. They translated the letter. He was so impressed 
with the erudition of the writer, he himself sent the quanti quantity of gold to America. He purchased the freedom of Ayub bin Suleiman. He sailed across the Atlantic to England. Six weeks he learned uh, English during the six week uh, passage, even though he was very sick for most of the trip. When he got here, he began to debate and discuss theology with the Anglican priests and bishops. They were so impressed with him, they made him a full re uh, member of the Spalding Regents Society, which at the time was the most prestigious academic uh, fraternity in the world. It was members included Sir Isaac Newton and Alexander Pope and others. So a fool, not an honorary member. And most, a lot of his life, especially here in Britain, we know from the records of the Spalding Regent Society. And his life was chronicled in the United States by a gentleman by the name of Gallaudet. And his story, uh, The Fortunate Slave, is, and, and this shows the neglect, is the oldest extant work of African American literature, the oldest work uh, about an African in the Americas is about a Muslim. And in fact, we find that out of the 10 extant slave narratives, I think uh, eight of them were written by Muslims because Muslims had literacy. And so they could write in Arabic. So we have Ayub bin Suleiman, we have Omar bin Said, we have Abu Bakr of Jamaica, and, and many others whose literacy availed them. And in this case, uh, Ayub bin Suleiman's literacy was instrumental in his freedom. While he was here in England, we mentioned he debated the Anglicans. They were so impressed. They eventually got him an audience with the queen. The queen was so impressed. She outfitted him with a ship full of the latest literature, technological implements, instruments, and made him an agent for the royal uh, African company, which might not be such a good thing, and sent him back to Africa as a free man. And once he, and then his story is even more miraculous. Oh, also, while he was in Britain, two things happened. You can see if you go online and you just do a Google image, A.U. Ben Soleiman, you'll see him painted in traditional Fulani garment, a big white turban, a white boo-boo, grand boo-boo. The, the, and uh, he wasn't wearing those clothes because he didn't have it. So the painter, he said, I'll agree to be painted on one condition. You paint me in my traditional garment. They said, well, where is it? He said, well, you just imagine it. And he said, the, the artist said, we've never seen it. How can we paint you in your traditional clothes? And we've never seen them. He said, well, you, you paint Jesus. You never saw him. Yeah. <laughs> that was his response. Uh, Anyway, so he described it. And so the picture you see, if you uh, search it, is a picture based on his description to the artist of how the boo-boo and how the turban looked. So it's an incredible figure. He also wrote, while he was here in England, three copies of the Quran from his memory. And unfortunately, they've all been lost, but it's documented in the records of the Spalding Regent Society that Ayyub bin Suleiman wrote three copies of the Qur'an from his memory while he was here in, in England. When he went back home, it was an amazing thing happened. Uh, he was captured by Mandinkos. And when he was on his way back to his village in Senegal, they passed the same raiding party that had captured him and, and sold him to Captain Pike. So he, he now he has pistols. They didn't recognize him. He's all done up in this British garb. And he has pistols, and he's like, I want to kill him. <laughs> and uh, the gentleman who was with him, I don't know if it was, I think it was Gallaudet, no, or another uh, Britishman. He said, no, they're too numerous, and they'll overwhelm us. So he said, OK, let's talk to them. So he asked him, he said, you remember about two years ago, you captured this Fulani guy, and uh, you sold him to Captain Pike on such and such ship. And he said, oh, we remember that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually him. He's, 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 they said, you know, a strange thing happened. So we sold him, and in exchange, we got rum, and we got pistols and muskets and some gold. And the strangest thing happened. We gave the muskets to the guns to our king as a present. 
And then one day, one of the guns misfired and killed the king. And he said, Kalas, <laughs> I don't need to do anything. So just a, an incredible story. And he was one of uh, the slaves who came back to Africa, who successfully reunited with his family. As you know, I, well, I, I haven't seen the film in a while, but I think it shows Ibrahim Abdurrahman did make it back to Africa after freeing himself, being freed, also based on a letter. His letter was actually the Fatiha and a few notes that he wrote after almost 30 years in bondage. He still could write a beautiful West African Arabic script. And if, if you see his picture, usually it's a picture and he wrote underneath it, Ismuhu Abdurrahman. So you've probably seen that picture. And uh, anyway, he wrote a letter to the king of Morocco. So there's an incredible fraternity between all the Muslims in West Africa, asking him to uh, petition the United States for his freedom. So the king of Morocco actually sent a letter to uh, Andrew Jackson, the president at that time, his secretary of state, Henry Clay, uh, sent the letter to Ibrahim Abdurrahman's uh, uh, owner at that time, asking that he be freed. And he actually complied with certain conditions that he immediately leave and go back to Africa. But Ibrahim, he wanted to free his family, so he went on a speaking tour in the north. And during that speaking tour, uh, he was very outspoken against uh, slavery because this, most of the tour was sponsored by abolitionists. When he was in Boston, and this is an interesting historical twist, when he was in Boston, he actually spoke in the church of David Walker. And there are those who say David Walker's appeals, which is one of the strongest anti-slavery appeals that was written during the slavery period, was actually influenced by the exchange that took place between Ibrahim Abdurrahman and David Walker while Ibrahim was in Boston. And he eventually went back to uh, DC and sailed to Africa. On the ship was the first, who would become the first president of Liberia. And he made it to Africa, but he never made it back to Futa Jalon. He died shortly after his uh, touching base uh, in Africa. He became sick, but the first thing he did was he prayed. Some people said he had left Islam, uh, and there's a debate. Uh, but the first thing he did when he was free, he started writing copies of the Fatiha and writing uh, various uh, things in Arabic. When he got to Africa, the first thing he did was pray to Rakats. So that puts that particular historical debate to rest. Uh, so they're, they're amazing, incredible stories, and it behooves us to study them because it's part of the history of Muslims in the Western world. Like I tell people in the United States, because a lot of times you go places, uh, you show this film or, or related films, you introduce the literature, you talk about the issues and people, you know, Afghanis, Pakistanis, Arabs, what does it concern me? This is only concern to people of African descent. And I say to them, then you must not be a Muslim. This is part of the history of the Ummah. This is the history of the Ummah in the West. This is the roots of the Muslim people. So just as we uh, study how Islam spread to uh, Egypt and Syria, how Islam spread to India, how Islam spread to Malaysia and Indonesia, we should be concerned and we take great pride that, oh, Islam wasn't spread by the sword. There were missionaries and merchants who went to these places and they introduced Islam through peaceful means. Then uh, shouldn't we be concerned about the roots of Islam and here in the Western countries? And uh, especially when, as Muslims, like now there's a lot of talk about uh, and this is more relevant probably in the United States. Muslims don't belong here. People with, uh, can't even speak English straight, talking about Muslims don't belong here. And uh, you, know, you know, who are you? They even brought uh, Gert Wilders over there, the, the Dutch Islam, anti-Islamic racist, to give speeches. Like, who are you people? We've been, been here for 400 something years. And 
blood, our blood, sweat, and tears built this country. And uh, Sylvia and Diouf's, her research shows that upwards, well over, but minimally 20% of all the slaves brought there were Muslims, one in five. And in some areas, because of the nature of the crops, where they grew crops such as rice, which is very popular in the Delta areas, and so said the Senegambia area, which is almost 100% Muslims, the rice growers would prefer slaves from those areas because rice is a very labor-intensive crop that takes a lot of know-how. So in areas like the Mississippi Delta, where you had a lot of rice cultivation, some of those areas, over 50% of the slaves were Muslims. The, off the coast of Georgia and the Carolinas, the same thing. Parts of Virginia, over 50% of the slaves were Muslims. A lot of you might, some of you might be of Jamaican ancestry. Uh, for a period of time, about 100 years is documented, over 50% of all the slaves brought to Jamaica were from most areas that are majority Muslim areas in, in West Africa. And you have people like Abu Bakr Siddiq and others who were fluent in Arabic. Trinidad, some of you might be from Trinidad. Trinidad, you had the Free Mandingo Society, which was a Muslim anti-slavery society that worked to liberate all the Muslims and then others in Trinidad. During the War of 1812, they liberated over 1,200 slaves from the American South, brought them to the Caribbean to fight against the British in the War of 1812. And upwards to three or 400 of them accepted Islam. And so they weren't just liberating Muslims, they were liberating anyone they could liberate. And so those are Muslims undertaking those efforts. So that's a great part of our history. And by connecting with that history, saying that's my history, that's instant legitimacy. How can you tell me I don't belong? Those are my ancestors. What do you mean? They're Muslims. All Muslims are brothers. Those are my Muslim brothers and sisters. Their blood, sweat, and tears built this country. In the, in the Caribbean, there was a high percentage of Muslims. The wealth of Britain came from the Caribbean, the sugar, there was white gold. Oxford, Cambridge, they all built their endowments on sugar. They built their endowments on sugar. The British crown in the 17th, 18th century, a lot of their wealth was coming from sugar in the Caribbean, it was brutal. It was a brutal operation. In, in America, at the time of liberation, the number of slaves who were there were three to four times the number of slaves that were imported in. So the population increased. In the Caribbean, the number of slaves was less than the slaves that were imported in. That's the brutality of working sugar cane fields, getting cut up. Like sometimes you cut your finger on a blade of grass, think that blade of grass being 20 times taller. And, and much sharper and firmer, like, a, like as hard as this, this column, razor sharp. And you're in there slashing it with your hands, cutting your arms up, getting infections. You're working in the presses. If your arm got caught in the press, it was economically better to just cut your arm off than to stop the press. So your hand got caught. McKendall, who, who was one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution, yeah, one arm, he, one hand. He lost his hand in a sugar cane press. Bookman, one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution, was a Muslim. A lot of the Muslims called Bookman because they had their Qur'ans and they were always reading it. Now, this is our history. And, and the, the famous Haitian voodoo ceremony, it might have been a molid, and they just didn't know what was going on. They said it's a voodoo ceremony. No, and they look into all these things. That's our history. And so it behooves us to know it. And, and new Muslims, people coming into Islam, shall hold on to that history. You have Muslims become a Muslim and they're taught by some crazy people. Your family are kufar, you have to divorce yourself. It's like, wala wa bara. You know, you have to disavow them. How about making dawah to them? How about just treating them like decent people? That's your family. So we lose all the capital we have. We have friends that we went to school with. They're ministers now. We can't go and like, listen, we're having a problem. <laughs> You're a minister? Yo, what's up? Let's have some tea, then I got to ask a favor from you. So I know the kufar, break off relations. 
a lot of us went through that phase, myself included, where we don't have relations with our family, friends, we don't have relations. Then we problemize even, even relation, like how do we make dawah to these people? We have dawah seminars, which is basically how do we talk to people we grew up with? <laughs> We're like sitting around intellectualizing, like how do we talk, man? <laughs> And this is tough, man. We need to bring a big shake for this one. We need to bring a milkshake. Just go, just go and, and, and reintroduce yourself. Like, yeah, I've been gone for a while. and I know y'all miss me. I miss you too. And I was tripping for a few years. It's all right now. They like looking at you, got a baggy shirt on, they look and see if something's ticking up under there. <laughs> no, it's cool. <laughs> so really, I mean, we, we, have to, we have to connect with our people. These are our people. We have to connect with our people. We have to be people of service. You're the best people raised up for humanity to serve humanity to serve humanity. So, inshallah, Allah Ta'ala make it easy. And it, it makes it easier when we connect with our history because it's a common history. So if we're studying and connecting with the history of Muslim slaves, that connects us with the history of all slaves. And we connect with the history of all slaves, we connect it with the history of all of those people who descended from all of those slaves. And so we, we start to, to realize we have common struggles. We have common issues. We have common pathologies that we have to work through sometimes. And we can share each other's experiences in terms of how we work through those pathologies. How do we rehumanize ourselves? One point that uh, uh, Dr. Diouf makes in her book is that for a lot of the Muslim slaves, they never surrendered their humanity. They never surrendered their dignity. And you can see in the portraits of them, portraits of people like Ayyub bin Suleyman, Ibrahim Abdurrahman. So you see him and this is big fro and he's dignified after 30 years of slavery. He hasn't been broken. Uh, Ayyub bin Suleyman was never broken. Omar bin Said, we have portraits of him. He was never broken. Uh, and many others, they weren't broken. They maintained their dignity. Uh, Muhammad Ali, one of the most uh, illustrious Muslims in the Western world, once the most popular person on earth, when they did the story of his life, what was the theme song? No matter what you take from me, you can't take away my dignity. You could take my title. They took Ali's title. They took Ali's money. They took Ali's thought they took his fame, they took his boxing career, right at the height of his career. You can't box anymore in America. They took everything, but they didn't take his dignity. And because they didn't take his dignity, he's known as the people's champ. And he inspired a whole generation. And he didn't, just didn't inspire Muslims. He inspired, oppre inspired oppressed people everything, everywhere because he stood up to the mighty American war machine and said, I'm not killing anybody for you, especially people who never did anything to me. And people were inspired. So we have a role as Muslims to go out there and inspire people with our courage and our dignity and not create fear in people. I was riding down here and just talking with Brother Dawood and some of the things that are happening is, are just ludicrous. Like people afraid of Muslims because of what Muslims are doing and what Muslims are saying and the attitudes that Muslims have. This is insanity. We're supposed to be a source of inspiration for people, motivation for people. And things are gonna get worse before they get better. People are gonna need some people who can reach out and give a helping hand and help uplift people. So we'll stop there. Perhaps you have some questions. That's just rambling on. Please forgive me. May Allah Ta'ala bless you all. Give you uh, much, much tawfiq. May Allah Ta'ala make your path to paradise a smooth one. Remove all the obstacles in your path. May Allah Ta'ala put wind in your sails. May Allah Ta'ala may, may put, put light in your hearts. 
May Allah Ta'ala bring us all together for common causes. May Allah Ta'ala help us to break down the barriers that we build between each other so we can come together and do great things together. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.